This is a homily for Good Friday. The first reading comes from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 52, verse 13, to chapter 53, verse 12. The second reading comes from the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 4, verses 14 to 16, and chapter 5, verses 7 to 9. The Gospel for today is the Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John, chapter 18, verse 1, to chapter 19, verse 42. We have four Passion narratives in the New Testament, that is, four accounts of the events surrounding the crucifixion of Jesus. If you examine these four accounts side by side, you'll notice that there are a number of differences. That's to be expected because each of the four evangelists is presenting the same story but from a different perspective. In his book, Archaeology, A Very Short Introduction, Paul Barn reminds us that it is not unusual to have significant discrepancies in the historical record. He offers the example of an event that occurred almost 150 years ago, the Battle of Little Bighorn. This American battle was fought between federal troops, led by George Custer, and Northern Plains Indians, led by Sitting Bull. No one denies that the battle took place. However, Barn tells us that all the surviving texts and eyewitness accounts concerning Custer's crushing defeat at the Battle of the Little Bighorn, which took place as recently as 1876, are substantially different, not only in terms of what happened and how, but even in such basics such as numbers on either side. Even though there are discrepancies in the four passion narratives, the evangelists agree about the main sequence of events. Jesus shared a final meal with his disciples, the meal that Christians traditionally refer to as the Last Supper. Following that meal, Jesus and the disciples left the city crossed the Kidron Valley and walked up to the Mount of Olives. The Gospels of Mark and Matthew give a specific location, a place called Gethsemane. Luke mentions only the Mount of Olives. John simply tells us that it was a garden. Jesus is arrested in the garden. Here you can see the Church of All Nations, built in 1924, on the traditional site of the garden in which Jesus prayed. Alongside the photo of the church, you can see one of the ancient olive trees in the garden. Jesus is arrested and put on trial. Peter, with another disciple, followed Jesus to the high priest's house, remaining outside at the door. It is here that Peter, when challenged, denied three times even knowing Jesus. Jesus is brought before Caiaphas, the high priest. The church that you can see here is St. Peter in Gallicantu, a name that means St. Peter at Cockcrow. It is the traditional site of the house of the high priest. A set of statues outside the church depicts the scene of Peter's denial and the place where he wept bitterly after the betrayal. If this is indeed the site of Jesus' interrogation before the high priest, it is quite probable that Jesus was led up to the house on the steps that you can see in the photograph here. All four Gospels tell us that Jesus was crucified and all four Gospels mention Joseph of Arimathea, who approached Pilate asking for the body of Jesus. Once taken down from the cross, the body of Jesus is wrapped in a linen shroud and placed in a tomb, hewn in the rock. In all probability, the tomb looked something like this. Here you can see the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, 
built over the traditional sites of Golgotha and the tomb in which the body of Jesus was laid. The first church on this site was built by the Roman Emperor Constantine in the 4th century AD. The site of the crucifixion and burial of Jesus was outside the city walls at the time of Jesus. About ten years after the death of Jesus, the wall city was enlarged, and the site of Golgotha and the Holy Sepulchre were then incorporated within the city walls of Jerusalem, as they are today. The dome on the left, the larger of the two domes, is situated above the site of the Holy Sepulchre. These photographs are taken inside the church of the Holy Sepulchre. The photo on the left is looking down from the top of the dome onto what is known as the Edicool, the tomb of Christ. The photograph on the right is looking upwards from the Edicool towards the inside of the dome. So despite a number of discrepancies, the four evangelists agree about the main events of the Passion narrative. But none of the disciples had imagined, even for a moment, that Jesus would be arrested and crucified. A crucified Messiah was inconceivable. Writing about 20 years after the crucifixion, St. Paul told the Corinthians, We are proclaiming a crucified Christ. To the Jews, a stumbling block. To the Gentiles, foolishness. A crucified Messiah was a stumbling block to the Jews and sheer foolishness to Gentiles. New Testament scholar Tom Wright makes this observation. The very mention of crucifixion was taboo in polite Roman circles, since it was the lowest form of capital punishment reserved for slaves and rebels. As for the Jews, the very idea of a crucified Messiah was scandalous. A crucified Messiah was a horrible parody of the kingdom dreams that many were cherishing. It immediately implied that Israel's national hope was being radically redrawn downward. As I pointed out on Palm Sunday... In the thousand years between King David and Jesus, the Jewish nation had been conquered by one superpower after another. The Assyrians wiped out the northern kingdom of Israel in the 8th century BC. The Babylonians had conquered Jerusalem in the 6th century, destroying the Temple of Solomon and taking thousands of Jews into exile in Babylon. In the 6th century, the Jewish homeland came under Persian control. And when the Persians were defeated by the armies of Alexander the Great, the Jews were subject to the successors of Alexander, firstly the Ptolemaic kingdom of Egypt and later by the Seleucids. Finally, by the time of Jesus, the Jews were subject to the might of imperial Rome. So you can imagine how during that thousand years, Jews looked back longingly to the time of King David. Under his reign, they were a united people, free of foreign overlords. If only God would send another anointed one, like King David, to restore the fortunes of Israel. The hopes of many Jewish people are reflected in the so-called Psalms of Solomon, which were written not by King Solomon, the son of David, but by a 1st century BC writer. In one of these Psalms we read, Raise up for them their king, the son of David, to destroy the unrighteous rulers, to purge Jerusalem from Gentiles. He will have Gentile nations serving under his yoke. He will be a righteous king, the Lord Messiah. Undoubtedly, many of those people who welcomed Jesus into the city on Palm Sunday had hoped that he would be the one to destroy the unrighteous rulers, 
and to purge Jerusalem from Gentiles, that he would be the one to tell the Romans to go home. Well, a crucified Messiah could hardly do that. That is why the crucifixion of Jesus was such a stumbling block to the Jews. But what about the Gentiles? Unlike the Jews, the Roman world did not have a problem with a God appearing in human form. But divinity was for the very greatest of the great, for victors, heroes and kings, not for someone who had been crucified. Tom Wright tells us that if the Messiah's crucifixion was scandalous to Jews, it was sheer madness to non-Jews. The early cultured despisers of Christianity had no trouble mocking the very idea of worshipping a crucified man. A famous cartoon from the Palatine in Rome dated to some point during the first three centuries of the Common Era, makes that point. Let's visit the Palatine and have a look at the cartoon or graffito that Tom Wright is talking about. Here you can see what the city of Rome looked like in the first century AD, and you may be able to recognise a few familiar landmarks. Here you can see the Colosseum, construction of the Colosseum began under the Emperor Vespasian in 70 AD, and it opened under his son Titus in 80 AD. It was largely paid for from the spoils of the war against the Jews and the looting of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Here are the imperial palaces on the Palatine. The Palatine was the grandest and most exclusive of Rome's famous seven hills. According to tradition, Rome began on the Palatine. And here is the Circus Maximus. In its prime, the Circus Maximus was more than 2,000 feet or about 610 metres long and more than 400 feet or about 122 metres wide. It remains the largest sports stadium ever constructed, easily capable of holding 150,000 fans. Nothing remains of the Circus Maximus today except the site itself, and from this video clip you can get an idea of how large it was. Among the ruins that you see opposite on the Palatine Hill is the House of Augustus, it is one of the best-preserved ancient houses in Rome. But I've brought you to this site because one of the ruins that was unearthed on the Palatine Hill is known as the Domus Gelotziana. When the Domus Gelotziana was discovered in 1857, an interesting graffito was discovered on one of the walls, and you can see it here. The graffito dates from some time between the late 1st century to the late 3rd century, with the beginning of the 3rd century considered to be the most likely. This makes the graffito a little easier to see. A figure is hanging on a cross. But notice that the head of the crucified figure is the head of a donkey. A figure to the left is looking up at the cross. The words below are written in Greek, Alexamenos sebitai theon. The words mean, Alexamenos worships God. That is how the pagan Roman world regarded the idea of a crucified Messiah, something to be ridiculed. A crucified Messiah, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to the pagan world. Historian Tom Holland summarises the objections of both the Jewish and Roman worlds to the idea of a crucified divinity. That a man who had been crucified might be hailed as a god could not help but be seen by people everywhere across the Roman world as scandalous, obscene, 
grotesque. The ultimate offensiveness, though, was to one particular people, Jesus' own. The Jews, unlike their rulers, did not believe that a man might become a god. They believed that there was only the one almighty eternal deity, creator of the heavens and the earth. He was worshipped by them as the Most High God, the Lord of hosts, the master of all the earth. Empires were his to order, mountains to melt like wax. That such a God of all gods might have had a son, and that this son, suffering the fate of a slave, might have been tortured to death on a cross, were claims as stupefying as they were to most Jews repellent. No more shocking a reversal of their most devoutly held assumptions could possibly have been imagined. Not merely blasphemy, it was madness. How things have changed over the centuries. The very mention of crucifixion may have been taboo in polite Roman circles, but today the cross has become a fashion accessory. And sadly, many of our contemporaries are totally unaware of the symbolism of the cross. When a woman went to a jewellery store to buy a cross that she could wear around her neck, the sales assistant showed her the crosses that he had in stock. After he'd shown the woman some plain silver and gold crosses, he then added, If you don't want a plain cross, we do have some with a little man on it. Bishop Robert Barron offers this reflection. We are so accustomed to seeing religious images of Jesus on the cross that much of the horror and humiliation of crucifixion is lost on us. But for a person of the first century operating within the confines of the Roman Empire, crucifixion was about the worst thing that he or she could imagine. What was involved in that form of capital punishment was just too vividly present in the popular imagination. Theologian Fleming Rutledge reminds us that crucifixion was specifically designed to be the ultimate insult to personal dignity, the last word in humiliating and dehumanizing treatment. Degradation was the whole point. The famous Roman philosopher, politician and orator Cicero described crucifixion as the most cruel and disgusting penalty. It was, he said, the most extreme form of torture inflicted upon slaves. The Jewish historian Josephus describes it as the most pitiable of deaths. Quoting the Roman historian and politician Tacitus, Tom Holland writes, No death was more excruciating, more contemptible than crucifixion. To be hung naked, long in agony, swelling with ugly wheels on the shoulders and chest, helpless to beat away the clamorous birds. Such a fate, Roman intellectuals agreed, was the worst imaginable. Even the disciples of Jesus struggled with the idea of a crucified Messiah, but they soon came to realize that the idea of a suffering and dying Messiah was already present in the Scriptures, if only they had been attentive. In John's Gospel, Jesus says, You search the Scriptures, believing that in them you have eternal life. It is these that bear witness about me. If you believe Moses, you would believe me, for it was about me that he wrote. When Jesus refers here to the scriptures, he is, of course, talking about the Hebrew scriptures, or what we call the Old Testament. When the risen Lord appeared to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, he chided them. How foolish you are, so slow to believe all that the prophets said. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer and so enter into his glory? Then 
beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. And surely some of the key passages in the scriptures that pointed to a suffering Messiah are to be found in the prophet Isaiah. The book of Isaiah is one of the most complex of the prophetic books in the Bible. Most passages in this book are poetry, often complex and elusive. There are 66 chapters in Isaiah. But there is a scholarly consensus that the book of Isaiah, as we now have it, was written over several centuries and by at least three different authors. The prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, lived in Jerusalem during the last half of the 8th century BC. His prophecies are deeply rooted in his own time and place, and many of them address current events in his own day. Only rarely does he tell us what these events are, but his audience, of course, would have known immediately, since they were living through them as well. Scholars attribute chapters 1 to 39 to the prophet Isaiah. Chapters 40 to 55 are written by an anonymous prophet who lived in the 6th century BC during the Babylonian exile. Biblical scholars refer to him as Second Isaiah. He wrote towards the end of the Babylonian exile. Since Babylon was defeated by the Persian king Cyrus in 539 BC, that gives us some indication of when Second Isaiah was written. Chapters 56 to 66 are also written by an anonymous prophet called Third Isaiah by scholars. These chapters are set in the land of Israel shortly after the end of exile, so roughly late in the 6th century BC, after the temple had been rebuilt in 515 BC. Our first reading today comes from 2nd Isaiah. These chapters contain a set of servant songs, in which redemption and victory are promised to a suffering servant of the Lord. Today's first reading is the fourth servant song. Fleming Rutledge explains, In Isaiah 53, one of the most celebrated passages in the entire Bible, we read of a mysterious figure, a suffering servant of God, who is despised and rejected, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, a man who goes like a lamb to the slaughter, a man who bears in his own body the sins of others. In this famous image, the early Christians saw their Lord and felt that they understood for the first time what Isaiah saw by revelation and faith. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. When in chapter 1 of John's Gospel, John the Baptist sees Jesus pass by, he says, Look, there is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. This enigmatic image of the Lamb of God remains dormant until chapter 19, when John tells us that when Jesus had given over his spirit on the cross, that it was the day of preparation about the sixth hour. The day of preparation was the day on which the Passover lambs were slaughtered in the temple. So Jesus, the Lamb of God, dies at exactly the same time that the Passover lambs are being slaughtered. The fact that Jesus chose to die at Passover time is the key to understanding the meaning of his death. Jewish New Testament scholar Amy Jill Levine explains it this way, If we think of Jesus as the Passover offering, we can better understand how John's symbolism works. That first night of Passover, at the time of the exodus from Egypt, is when the angel of death 
passed over the houses of the Israelites, those houses marked with the blood of the original paschal offering, but killed the firstborn of all the Egyptians. Jesus, as the new paschal lamb, the lamb who takes away sin, will similarly save his people for eternal life. The original Passover marked the movement from slavery to freedom. The Passover for John, symbolically, marks the movement from sin to reconciliation, from death to life. Fleming Rutledge writes, The Passover and the Exodus are the shaping events of Hebrew history, and for Jews and Christians alike, they are the central images of God's activity, so much so that the earliest Christians immediately understood the crucifixion and resurrection as the new Passover and Exodus, the climax of the drama of deliverance. So Jesus is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Listen to Fleming Rutledge. Not sins, but sin. Sin as understood as a power, a slave master, a tyrant with absolute sway over poor fallen Adam, who was all of us. The human race, as far as God is concerned, is lost, doomed, gone except for one thing, except for the decision of God to make it come out differently because of his grace. Bishop Robert Barron makes a similar point. The scriptural authors understand sin not so much as a series of acts, but as a condition in which we are stuck, something akin to an addiction or a contagious disease. No amount of merely human effort could possibly solve the problem. Rather, some power has to come from outside of us in order to clean up the mess. Something awful has to be done on our behalf in order to offset the awfulness of sin. With this biblical realism in mind, we can begin to comprehend why the crucifixion of the Son of God was necessary. The English New Testament scholar Tom Wright points out that you do not have to be able to answer the question why before the cross can have its effect. Think about it. You don't have to understand music theory or acoustics to be moved by a wonderful violin solo. You don't have to understand cooking before you can enjoy a good meal. In the same way, you don't have to have a theory about why the cross is so powerful before you can be moved and changed, before you can know yourself loved and forgiven because of Jesus' death. How true! I can enjoy a meal without knowing a thing about cooking. I am able to enjoy music without knowing a thing about the theory of music. In the same way, a vaccine is effective whether or not I understand how it works. So likewise, I am saved from the power of sin and death by the death of Christ, even if I find that hard to understand. Before Jesus dies... The Gospel of John tells us that Jesus, knowing that everything had now been completed and so that Scripture should be fulfilled, he said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so putting a sponge soaked in the wine on a hyssop stick, they held it to his mouth. Here John's Gospel again alludes to the Passover story. It is only John's Gospel that mentions the hyssop stick, and this takes us to Exodus chapter 12, verse 22, which specifies that hyssop should be used to sprinkle the blood of the paschal lamb on the doorposts of the Israelite homes. After Jesus had taken the wine, he said, It is completed, and bowing his head, 
he gave over his spirit. With those few verses, John emphasizes the fact that everything had now been completed. The Greek verb that he uses here is tetelestai. That is the final word that Jesus speaks in John's Gospel. Tetelestai. It is completed. That is very emphatic. Here on the cross, the work of Jesus is completed. Holy Week began with Palm Sunday. On the Thursday of this week, Jesus celebrated a final meal with his disciples. And on the Friday, today, he was crucified. Holy Week reaches its climax on Easter Sunday, the day of resurrection. But John's Gospel makes the point that it is precisely on the cross that the work of Jesus is carried to its completion. That's what it is completed means. What then is the resurrection? The resurrection doesn't cancel out the crucifixion as if it were only a passing episode on the way to Easter. The resurrection vindicates the crucifixion. The Father and the Son together in the power of the Spirit are saying to us that the work the Father gave the Son to accomplish is consummated, completed, finished as he dies on the cross. The ruler of this world has been vanquished and Jesus, the sacrificial Lamb of God, has won this victory on the cross. He has taken away the sin of the world. In the words of today's second reading from the letter to the Hebrews, He became for all who obey Him the source of eternal salvation.